Welcome to Dome to Home again this week. My name is Tara. I'm a presenter here at the Fisk Planetarium. I'm a planetary scientist, CU alum, and a whole bunch of other stuff too. And I have my friend Jeremy here with me again this week. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah. Hey, how's it going, Tara? Good to see you again and good to see all you guys joining in virtually for another week of uh, Dome to Home Perseverance to Mars. Got a, quite a good show for you guys planned out today. Um, just a couple reminders, please go full screen if you're having trouble viewing any of these, these uh, visuals. Um, everything that we see over here on the dome, I'll be doing live for you guys. And we also have uh, Amanda behind the scenes as our question master moderating the chat. So you can go ahead and say hello to her in the chat. Um, and if there's any questions that pop up during the show, feel free to chat them there. And uh, she'll relay them us, to us or answer you guys directly. Yep, and we'll try to get to some of those questions during the show, but we're going to have dedicated time at the end, too. So if you want to hold on to your questions or if we don't get to them right away, don't worry. We'll get you at the end. All right, I think that's all of the pre-show stuff to go through. So again, thank you for joining us for our Perseverance to Mars series. If you were with us last week, we talked about the actual launching of the spacecraft, how rockets work, and all this cool stuff that it takes to get that Perseverance spacecraft into space. But this week, we're going to talk about what it's actually like in space and some of the things that Perseverance is going to be experiencing and doing on its trip from Earth to Mars. It's a really long trip. You ever wondered what spacecraft do in all of that time that they're traveling? It's pretty interesting. So right now, you can see Jeremy's got us landed on the Earth. This is about what our sky looks like right now at one o'clock or so in Colorado. But again, our spacecraft has now left the Earth and blasted off into space, so we're going to do the same. Everybody, hang on. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so there we have left the Earth. We are outside of Earth's atmosphere. And this is the first kind of thing we wanted to talk about is what is space like? What is our space environment like? Well, the first thing that we need to think about is we have a lot of stuff here on Earth that we don't have in space. And in particular, I want you to think about that blue line that you can see going around the outside of the Earth there. That's the Earth's atmosphere. Now, you've probably been to some of our previous shows where we talk about how atmospheres are really important for planets, how it helps keep us warm. You know, it keeps us insulated from the harshness and the coldness of space. It holds in all that heat. But once you leave the Earth, you're outside of that atmosphere. And so you don't have that to hold any heat in around you. And so space can get very, very, very cold. It doesn't have that insulating blanket out there. You're outside of the atmosphere. So it can get down to almost like the coldest, coldest possible temperature, zero degrees Kelvin. Now, it's not quite that cold, but it's almost there. Space is very, very, very cold. 
So this is something that we have to think about when we're planning how we're going to get our spacecraft to another planet. Jeremy's also showing us a picture there of space radiation, which is another thing that we have to think about. There's all sorts of different kinds of radiation that are happening out in space. That picture there particularly is of what we call the Van Allen belts. Now these are belts of radiation that kind of go around the middle of the earth. They kind of look like ears sticking off the side like that. Now these are really highly radioactive. And so it could be very dangerous for a spacecraft to fly through all of this radiation. You probably know that radiation just in general is bad. It's especially bad for things like computers. It can really mess up your computers, which is very important for a spacecraft. So we have to be very careful about that kind of radiation. Now, there's other kinds of radiation out in space that we have to worry about too. One thing that we have to worry about is the radiation coming from the sun. The sun is constantly spewing out not just light in the form of photons, but also other little particles that are highly charged. What you can see here is what we call a coronal mass ejection or a CME. It's like a big giant solar flare that just spews all of these particles out into space. Boom, explosion, just like that. And so these travel through space and they can interact with anything that they come into contact with, including our spacecraft. So again, these radiation can fry the computers on the spacecraft and we don't want that. Now, the last type of radiation that we're going to talk about in this is something called cosmic rays. Maybe you've heard of these cosmic rays. They're another type of radiation that we see out in space and here on Earth too. They're very, very small particles that are emitted by stars, not just our sun, but all sorts of stars. They're very small, but they have tons of energy. And so they can blast through space. They travel really, really far until they hit something. Sometimes they can go through things. And again, these can affect all of the electrical systems on our spacecraft. So we have to think about all these different kinds of radiation as we're going through space. That's a really cool picture of those cosmic rays there. Yeah, and here's just another kind of image of them kind of coming in to our atmosphere. As they come in, they kind of hit other things, and they kind of break up a little bit. Um, you can actually see these if you do kind of some, some sort of high-level kind of physics experiments. Um, they're coming around us all the time, always kind of passing through, you know, walls and through our bodies even, things like that. Um, but when we're here on Earth, you know, we don't get hit with as many of them as if we say we were up in space. And so that's something we got to think about for astronauts and all our spacecraft up there. Exactly. Yeah. And again, here on Earth, we're protected by that atmosphere that blocks a lot of those cosmic rays. But occasionally they do get through. Luckily, not enough to hurt us. Now, another thing that we have to think about besides just radiation and cold, another very important thing is what they call space debris. And this isn't like dust. That's a thing, too. But we're talking about mostly satellites. So this is space junk that we people have put up into space. It's orbiting around the Earth. And there's lots of them. Do you guys want to guess how many how many satellites do you think are orbiting around the Earth right now? Do you have any good guesses? Yeah, go ahead and chat them. Just go ahead and chat your uh, answer if you have any. I would guess maybe like a thousand ish. Oh, that's a good guess. Maybe. Anybody else thinks? So it's actually a lot more than that. Right now, there are a total of 5,774 satellites that are going around the Earth. And even worse, half of those are dead. They've either reached the end of their life or they don't work anymore or they broke or something went wrong. And so really only about half of those are in use or even being capable of being used. So there's a lot of trash just floating around, around the Earth not so great. So that's something that we've got to watch out for. Jeremy, do we have our little satellite dots up there? Yeah. So right now, if you look closely, they're hard to see, especially on like kind of this virtual planetarium software, but you can see maybe if I orbit around to the nighttime side, it might be easier. You can see uh, these little dots going around and they're kind of orbiting the Earth. So those are all the active satellites that we have right now. Um, but Tara's talking about all this other 
you know, a space debris and whatnot that we have up there. So I can bring up a little graphic of all the inactive satellites. And these are all now the orange and kind of reddish dots that you have are up there. So you can see there's still a lot of space trash up there. <laughs> Maybe we can turn on those orbits so we can see those too. Oh yeah, here, I'll turn on the, the orbit lines of some of the satellites. So there we go. Those are all the satellites that you can see with your naked eye. And then we could turn on maybe some GPS satellites. There are those orbits. So a lot of stuff orbiting uh, orbiting our, our home Earth. You could probably imagine it takes a lot of people a lot of work just to keep those from running into each other. So we have to be able to track all of that stuff and know where it is so that we don't hit it as we're leaving the Earth, because that would be very bad. Even when they're past the satellites, we do still have to worry about micrometeorites, very small pieces of rock and dust that can hit our spacecraft. Some of those can strike at over 22,000 miles an hour. They're going real fast because there's no air resistance out there. And you can probably imagine, you know, even just a small rock hitting our spacecraft at 22,000 miles an hour is probably going to do some damage. It's not good for the spacecraft. So these are all tricky things that are, make it really hard for us out in space. Now, it's not just hard on our spacecraft. A lot of people ask, why would it be so hard to send people to another planet? Obviously, it's very hard for spacecraft, but people are a whole other thing. You know, they talk about us wanting to build colonies on Mars and do all this stuff to make it good for people. But it's really difficult to get people all the way to another planet. Aside from just the things that we just talked about with the spacecraft, there's other things that you have to think about that would affect people. Now, again, there's the cold and the radiation. Those are very bad for people, even worse than for spacecraft. That radiation won't just damage your computer systems. It kind of damages your internal computer systems. It's really bad for your nervous system. It can cause a lot of damage there, increases your risk of cancer. It can also damage things like your food supply. Can really mess up the food that you're trying to take with you and make that unhealthy. So that's a very bad thing. These are things that they have to think about on the ISS, the International Space Station, where you already know it's outside of Earth's atmosphere. There's people living up there and they're always doing tons of studies on how the space radiation and the space environment is affecting the people that live there. Jeremy's flying us over so we can get a good, cool close-up look at the ISS. Yeah, we're gonna get nice, nice up and cl up close and personal with it here, if I can find it. <laughs> you can actually find the ISS from your house. There's a couple of different websites. If you just Google how to track the ISS, there's several different sites that come up that'll show you where it is at any point in time, and you can see it as it passes over. If it ever passes over where you live. You can see it without even binoculars. It looks like a little moving star that goes across the sky. Here it comes. There we go. So there's our space station. And again, there's been tons of people that have lived up there, some for long periods of time, one for even a year. And so we're learning a lot about how this radiation environment affects people. Now, another thing that people have to worry about is getting used to the changes in gravity. We know Earth here, we have the amount of gravity that we have. If we consider that like one, people on the space station or in a spacecraft going to another planet are going to experience basically no gravity. It's still a very, very, very small amount of gravity, what they call microgravity. It's not quite zero, but almost none. And then once they get to Mars, that only has a third of the gravity that we have here on Earth. So for instance, on the space station, they have tons and tons of equipment that they use for things like exercise. Because living in this microgravity, your bones don't feel any resistance or your muscles, and so they can really start to deteriorate quickly. It's like if you don't exercise for years and years on end, your body's gonna kind of start to get really weak. It's really bad for your bones. And so on the space station, they've developed tons of exercise equipment that the astronauts use. You can see some pictures there and a great video of one of our astronauts doing a little workout. I think that's pretty cool. 
I just, you know, if you, any of you have listened to our podcast that we do, we just recently spoke with an astronaut who lived on the International Space Station for a couple of months. And he told us a little bit about the exercise that they have to do. And they end up doing about two hours of exercise every day, just so they don't end up losing a lot of muscle and bone mass and they can come back to earth still healthy. Cause that can also give you problems with like your hand-eye coordination and it doesn't just hurt the muscles in your arms and legs, but also things like your heart. And so these are all things that you have to think about. Now, another thing that we have to think about with people is that it's harder to take than just our spacecraft because people need things like, I don't know, what do people need that maybe a spacecraft wouldn't? Think of a couple of things. I can think of a couple of things. Any ideas, Jeremy? <clears throat> well, we definitely have kind of food and water. You know, you don't have to worry about feeding a spacecraft. But, um, you know, with me, even being in quarantine with the, you know, coronavirus pandemic going on right now, you know, I uh, get lonely sometimes, you know, I like to talk to people and human interaction is a very uh, important thing for people. So that's definitely one thing I would think would be a, a challenge if someone has to be up in space for a, a long time. Those are the things I was thinking of too. Food, water, bathrooms, robots don't have to go to the bathroom. That's something you got to worry about. And the more of that kind of stuff that you need to take to another planet that's going to cause a lot more weight on the spacecraft, which like we talked about last week is going to make it really hard for that spacecraft to get off of the earth and into space. All of that weight's going to slow it down. And to be able to get that off, you need bigger rockets, which cost more money and nobody likes that. So it's very, very complicated. A lot of bad stuff. And again, there is that isolation factor too, like Jeremy was saying. I know lots of us have been in quarantine or lockdown or isolation for a few months now and at least you know with us we can still go out into the yard or you know walk to the end of the street or go get the mail or something like that we can at least go outside and we're probably in something a little bigger than a space station which is maybe only like I don't know I'm looking at the size of my bed is like the biggest that some of these little rooms are so can you imagine being trapped in a tiny little closet sized space and never going outside. I think that would be really, really difficult. So think about how you felt while you've been kind of quarantined and how difficult that might be if you had to do it for a long time, like seven months to get to Mars. It'd be pretty tough. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about is what does the spacecraft do on its way to this other planet? We've already gotten it off of the Earth. We've talked about some of the difficulties of being in space, but what else do you think it might be doing while it's on its way to Mars? It's going to take it about seven months to get there. What are some things that a spacecraft might do? What are some things that you might do when you're maybe on a long car trip or a long plane ride or something? Maybe hey, read some books. <laughs> yeah. I am like a spacecraft in a lot of ways because the spacecraft mostly sleeps on its voyage. So it's going to spend a lot of time in low or no power, basically sleeping. But the spacecraft is also designed to kind of take care of itself if something does go wrong. So it'll have some sensors that are monitoring things as it's going. And if something goes wrong, it has the ability to wake up and fix itself. Now, this has already happened once with Perseverance. As it was leaving the Earth's atmosphere, it got out of the atmosphere and suddenly got very, very cold. More, more cold than it thought it was supposed to be. And so it turned itself into safe mode, kind of like. Oh, so everyone on the ground was freaking out, <laughs> but it ended up fixing itself. Jeremy's got a good little picture there. You can see the rover, which is kind of at the bottom. And then it's got all the different pieces of its landing gear and the spacecraft that's actually carrying it all the way to Mars. That's it kind of all broken up. So you can see the different pieces, how it's all put together in there. Now, sometimes something else that we need to do with our spacecraft while it's traveling is do some what we call trajectory corrective maneuvers. It's basically just change direction. Because things happen when you're floating through space. Again, it's a very, very, very long way to get to Mars, and it takes a very long time. And if you get a little bit off course right at the beginning, it's going to get worse and worse as you go. And so there are people here on Earth that are watching that, and occasionally they'll say, okay, we need to 
shift just a little bit this way, or we're going to miss the plan. Nobody wants that. <laughs> here, here you can see kind of a, a diagram that they use for the trajectory correction maneuvers. There's some that are actually planned. Now they do this to take advantage of things like the Earth's gravity and Mars's gravity. They can use those to get the spacecraft to where it's going with less, uh, less fuel and less effort, basically. But occasionally they have to jump in and say, okay, now we need you to turn just a little bit to the left. And so that'll keep it on track. Now, some of the other things that it does is it can test some of its instruments while it's on its way to another planet. So we know that Perseverance has tons and tons of instruments that we've seen. Uh, I think Jeremy's got a cool picture of it. It shows all of them. It's got cameras and sensors and all sorts of stuff. There we go. Um, and it can test all of those and kind of do some simulations as it's going to make sure that once it actually lands on the surface, everything is good to go, nothing broke, we're all happy and set. Now, this is something that lots of spacecraft do. Generally, Mars is kind of relatively easy to get to because it's closer. It doesn't take quite as long, but some of our other spacecrafts that we've sent out have to go to places like Jupiter and Saturn and even farther to Uranus and Neptune and even Pluto. So you can see here, a lot of times those spacecraft will go by other planets on their way, sometimes to take advantage of that gravity again, get a gravity assist. And they can do little science experiments on their way. They can test out some of those cameras. Um, we have some cool pictures here that our spacecraft Juno took of the Earth as it was leaving the Earth. We got some cool pictures back from that. There was also a spacecraft called Galileo that took some pictures of Venus that it went past on its way to Jupiter. So we get really cool pictures of places that we're not exactly heading, but are on the way. I think Jeremy had another cool one too that he was gonna show us. Mm -hmm. So in addition to just taking pictures, um, some spacecraft actually are equipped to <clears throat> make kind of, I guess, more formal scientific measurements, you could say. Um, so this is an example uh, that happened on the Cassini spacecraft which was a spacecraft that um, primarily orbited Saturn and explored the rings of Saturn as well as the planet. Um, and so this on the left, what you're seeing here is the cosmic dust analyzer. Um, and you can see on the right kind of where it was positioned on that Cassini spacecraft. Um, and basically what this did is as it, you know, flew through space, it, you can see it looks kind of like a little bucket. Um, and it basically sampled, you know, the cosmic dust and kind of scooped up little bits of dust as it went through space. Um, and it flew kind of near through the asteroid belt and it scooped up some cosmic dust in there. And so it did some, some studying of what the environment is like in between the planets. Absolutely. They can also do things like uh, measuring the magnetic field of the whole solar system, not just the individual planets, but there's a magnetic field that penetrates our whole solar system. Yeah, there it we go. It looks kind of like that, apparently. You know? Apparently. And so these are it, all things. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just say, it looks like, um, maybe if I could make it bigger here for you guys. Um, you can see there's kind of like, it looks like a little spiral shape. And so you could think, well, the, the sun's kind of just stationary, you know, to say in our in our solar system, why does it kind of have this, this spiral shape of magnetic fields that it's, you know, pushing out? And that's basically because of like the rotation over the course of a year, you know, the sun will be facing one way, be putting out the magnetic field. And then at, as you get further away from the sun um, at different locations in the solar system, there'll be um, different orientations of that magnetic field because it takes time for the, those magnetic fields to travel. And again, if you've come to some of our other shows, you probably know how important magnetic fields are for planets. And so for us to be able to measure those as we're traveling through space and find out about magnetic fields in between planets, it's another really important thing that we have to think about for our spacecraft. And again, that overall travel time from Earth to Mars is about seven months. So we have to think about these long-term things that we're dealing with, and that's just to get to Mars. Right, and so we've, that, we've been traveling to Mars this whole, this whole talk so far. I don't know, it's been maybe looked like a little bit boring, but what we're trying to do is show you that it does take some time to get there and we are moving <laughs> at a very but slow rate. You can also see that there's not a lot going on 
between Earth and Mars. It's a whole lot of empty space. It's not completely empty because, again, there's things like dust and cosmic rays and radiation. But otherwise, this is this is pretty much what it looks like. So you really got to think about that when you're especially thinking about people, sending people to other planets. What are you going to do for seven whole months when there's nothing? Mm hmm. On that note, we are getting towards the end of our time here. So I wanted to make sure we didn't miss any questions from anybody. I see we did have one from Dr. McFarland who asked about, uh, is there a learning curve for acclimation at lower gravity? So what I think you're asking is that, is, is it hard to learn how to work in lower gravity, not just the gravity we have on the earth? And from what I have heard, it is. I've heard of astronauts on like the International Space Station where there's just very little gravity, almost no gravity, um, really have to do a lot of training before they can just get up into that environment. Here, before they go up, they do a lot of training in giant pools at the Johnson Space Center down in Houston where they'll put on all of their uh, spacesuits and everything and go down in this pool where it's almost weightless, but not quite. And they'll get down there and practice using their instruments and tools and things uh, because it is very different. They also use uh, these planes, what they sometimes call the vomit comet, mm -hmm. where they'll fly these planes in a certain trajectory where it basically simulates microgravity for a short period of time, something like 30 seconds at a time. And so they have to do all sorts of training to be able to not just uh, know how to use things in different gravity, but also to acclimate their bodies so they don't immediately get sick in weightlessness. Maybe some of you have been on a roller coaster that kind of goes over a hill and your stomach comes up into your throat sometimes. It's like that all the time in space because there's not any gravity to hold everything down. So you really have to think about not just the things that you're doing, but how your body is going to react. And it's the same with Mars too, because again, it only has about a third of the gravity that the earth does. So that's gonna be, everything's gonna feel really weird. And so they do have to do a lot of training and stuff for that. I see another one. What would you bring on a seventh month journey to Mars? Music, books, games? Yes, all of the above, <laughs> probably. Um, I would definitely bring a lot of books. I would probably have to bring a lot of electronic books because they wouldn't let me take, you know, my whole apartment's worth. <laughs> But definitely books, music is a great idea too. I'd go crazy if I didn't have music all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of my favorite snacks, that would be pretty sweet. What about you, Jeremy? What would M you take? Music would be, be a, a huge one for me. I don't know when the last day I went, <clears throat> or, yeah, when it was the last day I made it through a full day without even listening to at least, at least one song. <laughs> so uh, music definitely, probably a lot of David Bowie. <laughs> Sitting, sitting out the window um <laughs> i don't know yeah some books some games yeah I don't know. again it's... i've heard astronauts talking about bringing pictures of their families or their dogs or their house or things like that things that remind them of home that's always a nice thing to have this looks like aurora says it might be difficult to play card games in low gravity that would be either difficult or really fun. I don't know. <laughs> it make it, uh, it would make the game 52 card pickup a lot easier. I don't know if anybody's ever played that. <laughs> or maybe a lot harder. <laughs> or maybe harder. Depending on how big your space is. That's true. Yeah, I don't that know. That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. That would be tough. Cards would be tough. Let's see. It looks like we have arrived to Mars here. Yeah, finally. The long, long 20 minute journey. We have made it. <laughs> I'll multiply that by a whole lot. And that's what it would be like trying to get there. Let's see, we've got like two more minutes if anyone else has any questions. Has a projected date been announced for the first base on the moon or Mars? Unfortunately not, maybe not unfortunately, but no, we honestly have no idea how long it's going to be before we can put people on another body that's not the Earth, at least in any sort of like permanent sense. Now they have said that with the Artemis program that NASA is using to send spacecraft to the moon, they have vowed that there are going to be people walking on the moon at least in 2024. So another four years, three and a half or so, they will have astronauts that are going to the moon again. 
probably not to stay for long periods of time, but we still don't have all of that worked out. There are a lot of people that are working on it. I am one of them who are trying to find resources on the moon that we could use uh, things like ice for water. Uh, we can use some of the dirt that's on the moon to help build habitats and things like that. But none of this is proven yet. So we're still working on that idea of getting a, a way for people to stay on the moon. The moon is a lot easier to do because it's just right there. It only takes about a day and a half to get up there. If something goes horribly wrong, we can get our astronauts back very quickly and easily. Going to Mars is a whole other thing. And most of the ideas are actually to use the moon as sort of a, a stop off point. If we can figure out how to get people to the moon and stay there, then we can go to Mars from there. And it's a little bit easier, but so far no projected dates for Mars, there's not any, even any idea of how long that might take. A lot of people have some really great ideas of how to do it and how things that might work, but nothing proven yet and nothing, definitely nothing we could actually put like a date stamp on yet. Not Keep yet. Keep listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions about <clears throat> spaceflight in general? How robots survive in the vacuums of space? Luckily, robots don't need air to breathe, so that's helpful. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a good point, huh? If Ooh, not, we do, are do, right do, at do, our do, 130 do. time. <laughs> So we can call it an afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us again. Uh, be sure to come back next week. We're going to be talking about the actual science of the mission that Perseverance is going to do, carrying out the mission. Talk about some of the challenges for operating a rover on another planet really, really far away. That's hard. Plus, we're going to talk a little bit more about not just Perseverance, the rover, but also its little helicopter ingenuity, which we haven't touched on too much yet. So that's going to be really fun. Come back and check that out with us next week. Uh, if you did have any questions that we didn't get to or you think of later, come back and comment on our video. We'll check those every now and then, and we'll try to get back to you with some answers. Otherwise, be sure to like and comment and subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming Dome Behold. And from all of us here, we hope we see you next week. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. See you later.